welcome to our penultimate Wednesday. Let's go. All right, I have a couple bluebirds for you just to start us off. The eastern bluebird. Uh, and uh, bluebirds are, are uh, uh, they like to make their nests like inside cavities in, in trees, places like that. So here's uh, a bluebird kind of investigating this potential uh, nesting site. Uh, doesn't like what it sees, it's off to find some other one. Bluebirds also defend their territory. They, they'll kind of claim something like two and a half acres. So here's a, a female eastern bluebird uh, ready to defend. It's spotted the intruder and it attacks. <laughs> Maybe not the most productive defense, but uh, such is the bluebird life. All right. Uh, any questions on uh, the proxy lab as you've been getting started on it or any of the other stuff we've been looking at? Yeah, uh, I guess I'm wondering what create, uh, what's it called, create a socket. Like within the starter code, like hints that you gave us, you said parse the input into like host name and port name and then you open a socket with mm -hmm. that code. Like I really, I wasn't sure within the diagram that we took a look at in class, like how that fits in, like between what entity and what entity are the same. Yeah, so for the proxy server, uh, we have some client. And it has some request it wants to make. Uh, and it's going to make that request via the proxy. So the starter code kind of had, gives you code that sets up the proxy, listening for connections on a certain port. And the client's going to uh, connect to the proxy on that port. and Proxy will open up a dedicated socket for that communication and then call this handle request function. And the comments in the handle request function says first you're going to get this HTTP request line from the client and you're going to need to parse that into the host name and the port, kind of the server somewhere out there that the client is trying to connect to. And then the proxy needs to open its own connection, its own socket to the server. And the uh, CS app header gives us a single function, which we used in the echo server on Monday, open client FD, where we give it the host and the port are the two arguments we provide to this function and then it returns it's going to return an integer which is the file descriptor for the socket it has opened to this host and port oh, okay so okay I was going to that yeah, this um, connection. Oh, so I thought the connection FD was between the client and the server. So that's where my connection is coming from. But it's between, it's between the client and the proxy. And proxy is becoming like a new client to the server. Exactly, yeah. The, the proxy is sort of acting on the client's behalf as a client to the server. It's going to pass along the request over the socket it opens, and then it's going to read the response from the server and just write that back to the client. Other questions on the lab? All right, let's actually start out with uh, a bit of review. 
so that um, where are we? Uh, so that we're all feeling good about the networking things. So first up, could we use printf to send bytes uh, over a socket? So we have some votes for all four options. Please discuss with your neighbors why you chose the answer you did. All right. It's been, uh, no one's concerned about eye sockets uh, and bytes. Uh, we can, in fact, use printf to write bytes to a socket. Uh, Anyone have uh, guesses for what system call I'm referring to here? Left? Dupe 2. Yes, we have seen that we can use dupe 2, or in general, we can run a command in the terminal, and instead of getting it printed out, instead of it being sent to the file of standard out, we can redirect it to another file. And it's the same idea here. We can redirect from standard out to whatever file the socket is. And now printf is going to send bytes to that file which is the socket. Does that make sense? Questions on this? All right, and speaking of parsing a uh, host and port, here uh, we're accessing the URL awb 663332 colon 15213 slash progress. And I'd like you to think about what the host port and file slash service, um, host port and, and resource uh, are, are the parts of how would this URL break down. All right, lots of votes for D. Here we have uh, the majority is correct. Um, that when we talk about the host, that's sort of everything before we give the port or the first slash. It's going to tell us kind of which machine, which computer, which destination on the network we're trying to go to. And then it, everything after that is kind of what we're asking that destination to give us. Questions on this? All right, so let's start. On today's main topic, which is how do we get a uh, computer program to be able to do multiple things at the same time. And to sort of illustrate why, in the context of, context of something we've been looking at, why this would be important, let's think about our echo server uh, from last time. And so I'm going to say that uh, time is going to pass from the top to the bottom of, of this diagram. And so we're going to think about what is the server doing? And then what is client one and client two doing in this, in this scenario? And so we start off client one. Connects to the server. The server accepts the connection. So now this client writes a message to our echo server. What does our echo server do with that message? It sends it right back. So it just, first it needs to call read to read the message, and then it's just going to immediately write it back. And our client reads, 
And then at this point, The user gets hungry, goes out to lunch. But the client one process still running, still connected to the server. And client two goes to connect. And unfortunately, the server is just sitting here waiting to read from client one. And so client two just can't get the echo server to do anything because the echo server is sitting there blocked, waiting for client one to send some information. Yeah. Could it just run like another like different process for client two like, that has different sockets? Yes, so you are you are stealing my thunder. The answer is multiple processes. That will solve this problem. Uh, because right now we just have the single server process, and when it's blocked in a read, it can't also be responding to some other client. And so one way that we can solve this. Via multi processing, that is having multiple processes involved in the server in order to give it uh, uh, the ability to respond to multiple clients. So, uh, in our. Yeah, so let me sketch out how the server is going to do that, and then I want to zoom out and talk about why. This sort of multiprocessing is useful in a more general way than making an echo server uh, a little better. So the change is going to come when a connection is accepted. So when the server accepts a connection, the first thing it will do is it will use a system call called fork which is going to make a new process that's a copy of the server process. So you can think of server process was going along, and then we hit a fork, and we just duplicate the process. And this, this new process we would call, it's called a child of the original server process. And we can also think about this uh, you may think, hey, this looks sort of like a tree. That's often how uh, these process relationships are, are envisioned. But we have the child process, and then it can handle going back and forth with client one, where then when client two comes in, The original server process is not tied up handling client one. It's still just able to listen for the connection. And again, when it gets that connection, it's going to fork off another copy, child two. And again, this new process that we forked off will handle communication with client two. PJ. And how many children we can fall? It just like depends on the processes of the server, right? Like depends on how many processes. Uh, so it's a good question. How many processes can we fork? Um, the operating system may just impose a constraint that you can only fork so many times. Um, this is to. Uh, 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 I'm going to write a bit of dangerous code on the board. This is what is sometimes referred to as a fork bomb because we enter the loop, fork creates a duplicate of this process, 
And I mean a complete duplicate, meaning it's running exactly the same code from exactly the same point. So now there are two processes. They both go around the while loop. They both fork again. Now we have four. Four turns into eight. And we just, if there's no limits on how many processes can be forked, then we quickly just consume all the system resources with these uh, infinitely spawning uh, uh, processes. Are we only ever working off of this sort of like central, uh, I guess, trunk that we fork off children ever? Or, uh, and then also, I guess, like this child 2C that we previously forked, uh, since it happened after we forked child 1? Um, so, in terms of can we, can children themselves fork off new child processes? They can. Uh, in this context, there'd be no need for that kind of complexity, but that's certainly a thing that can happen. Um, child 2, I mean, there, there are ways for uh, children of the same process to, I mean, because child 2 is a copy of the server process, it, whatever the server process knows about child 1, child 2 knows about that as well. Um, but as we'll talk about, sort of processes are not designed to be a bunch of them working together. Uh, they're specifically designed to be sort of isolated, standalone things. So if we want a bunch of things working together, we're probably going to need some different model. There's a third question. I don't know if I answered it. Uh, no, I think, my, my, I think one of my questions was two questions. Were like, do they only happen off of the single like trunk that you have here, or can the child? Alright. Other questions. Yeah. I think. Um, I had a question about the whole call. Um, could you just like if you like ran that like on any server, would it just like destroy the whole server? Uh, I think on Linux the default is to put in a limit on how many processes a user can create, and so you just quickly hit that limit and. Uh, you wouldn't take down, down the server, but without it, some protection like that, yes, this would definitely cause problems. Other questions? All right, so I want to talk more about the kind of mechanics of fork because they're kind of interesting and, and subtle. But I first want to zoom out a bit and talk about this idea of having multiple processes, of having the ability to have concurrency in our program, meaning Simultaneous overlapping or what we call concurrent computations. So here the server is listening for connections at the same time that child one is reading and writing uh, with client one, at the same time child two is reading and writing with client two. Uh, and it's do with this model be possible on a system that had only one CPU. They could only execute one instruction at a time. But definitely you'd be able to pause one child and continue another. Exactly. We talked about this context switching, the mechanism by which the system switches from running one process to another, and it's often doing this extremely rapidly. And so even if we only had one CPU, we could still be switching between these three processes continuously, and so they'd all like continue making progress. So concurrency is sort of distinct from the idea uh, that we can literally do two instructions at the same time, but we have kind of multiple things overlapping in time. So besides this echo server, uh, 
what are what are potential benefits from being able to have concurrent computation like this? Go. Well, you could like split up really hard computation into like little chunks, right? Yeah. So splitting up some larger task into smaller pieces. Uh, That there's no kind of hard distinctions here, but this tends to be a the related idea of parallelism, which we'll talk about on Friday. Um, concurrency, uh, we have multiple things going on, but not in the sense that we have a single task that we've split up just to like share multiple ways. Because um, to be for to split up the task in multiple ways, that sort of requires that we have multiple TPUs that we could do uh, actual simultaneous computation. Um, but concurrency applies even if we just have the one CPU. TJ? We just don't have to wait for like uh, that takes up like a long time. So we just like if there's a time that takes up a long time and just pause it and work on something else and come back to the show. Yeah, this is there's a a bunch of different ways in in and that if something is taking a long time, we're able to kind of switch away from it and come back. Um, so can anyone think of an example of a kind of task that we've talked about that might take a long time? Well, uh, this might not be a specific example. I'm just curious. So is concurrency happening for operating systems? Like, is everything? Uh, yes, concurrency is critical to operating systems. And in an operating systems class, you would typically spend weeks talking about different things related to concurrency. Uh, so if we have some slow input output, the ability to have some process handle the slow thing while we still have while other processes continue on. Can be very, uh, very helpful. I say that. Um, if you have like a server and some things take priority over other things, you could pause the low priority activity, do like a high priority activity, and go back to the low priority activity. Yeah, we can definitely. Um, prioritize some over over others. Uh, and if we have different tasks and different processes, that would allow us to prioritize one uh, in a way that might, might be difficult otherwise. Uh, other thoughts? Ben? If you're like trying to solve a puzzle or do a simulation, you could have many different children with different cases and see which one gets solved first. Hmm. So, Yeah, this is a kind of variation on splitting up the work. Not that we have one task, but many possible variations and kind of uh, send them all off going at once. Um, one, uh, one kind of special case of this slow I.O. that I want to uh, is that having this multiprocessing is actually very useful for any application that needs to interact with humans. For example, you might think about a uh, text editor like VS Code or Microsoft Word, and you save your file, and we know the disk is slow. And so if the application just spent all its time saving the file, maybe it would just freeze for some amount of time while it saves the file. And if you tried to keep typing or doing something while it was saving, it just wouldn't respond. And then it would suddenly catch up when saving the file was finished. But if we create another process, have this child process handle saving the file while the main process continues accepting input from the user, we can kind of 
do this slow work in the background while um, while still letting the user interact. Oh. So technically, when we save our files, they don't save immediately. Uh, it's unlikely that they would save immediately because it takes some amount of time to save. Them. Technically, if I just saved my my file and I closed it immediately, there would be a chance to save correctly. Uh, I think it would be hard to close it fast enough. Okay. But I'm sure there is a sequence of operations that one could create, um, such that I guess I have had the experience of working with the document. Um, the computer had crashed and rebooted. This happened several times, and the autosave worked each time, and the document was there. And then, of course, eventually it crashed in the particular bad way that just wiped the entire contents of the document. You are giving me more trust issues on technology. Uh, I mean, I hope this is something you take away from this class. Technology is hard and often wrong. <laughs> Fun. I guess my question is sort of how recently was this implemented? Because I feel like it's been a thing for a while, but I also feel like I remember in like fourth grade saving a Word document that taking like a minute to like a So uh, this idea of multiprocessing is many decades old. Um, and uh, the, uh, the kind of process model that we've been talked about dates back to uh, to, to Unix. Um, so one thing is that disks have gotten quite a bit faster um, over the years. So saving the file to a disk is a lot quicker. Um, and just because this multiprocessing technique existed doesn't mean it was easy or common for applications to take advantage of it. Um, and uh, both uh, the, the sophistication of software and the available tools for writing software that does this sort of thing uh, has certainly gotten better. Kevin. Oh, there's a quick question. I don't know if it's related, but is concurrent programming like similar to the idea of like asynchronous programming? Like we talked about it a lot in like, um, like software development. Uh, so. They are closely related ideas. Asynchronous meaning, say, I call a function, and it's just going to return at some later time. And meanwhile, the program keeps going. And so asynchronous, this function is executing asynchronously, and then at some point it finishes, and it interrupts the program uh, with that kind of event. So that is a kind of type of concurrent programming, that we have these overlapped uh, executions. Any other questions or comments? All right, so I want to talk a little more, bit more about fork. So fork doesn't take any parameters, returns an integer. It creates a child process that's going to have not just same code, but actually a complete copy of the entire memory of the program. And also the same register values. And here I'm highlighting our instruction pointer, our RIP register, which means that the child and the uh, it, when fork returns, the child and the parent are going to begin executing at the exact same instruction in their code, which is also the same. And they're going to share all the same variable values, uh, everything that's in memory. Another important feature is that child process gets a copy of the parent's file descriptor table, 
which means that the child will have open all it's kind of will have open all the same files that the parent had open. Um, which, when we're thinking about this echo server, when the child forks off, it needs to somehow access the socket that the original process opened when the child uh, when the client connected. And fortunately, the child just gets a copy of all the files that the original process had, which includes that software. So it can just use it immediately. Now, there's one thing that might be bothering some of you, which is, well, if the child and the original are exact copies, how are they doing different things? We have the child like doing some other like different stuff than the parent. And this is where the return value of fork comes in. So fork returns a different value in the child process than it does in the parent. And this is how the child would do something different than the parent, just by checking both the child and the parent, because they use the same code, would both check the return value with an if statement. But since the return value is different between the two, they could then do different things. And we'll see an example of this. For the child, fork's going to return zero. The parent fork will return the process ID of the child. And the idea of a process ID is pretty straightforward. Every process on the system gets assigned a unique integer. They're all greater than zero. Uh, and so in the parent, we'll just get some integer greater than zero, which is this identifier for the child process that is just created. And the child fork is going to return zero. So when you call it work, how do you know which one is which one is that? Is there a uh, We'll see an example in code in, in just a minute. Uh, but yeah, that's an important, important question. Huh? Why would you even, why would you need to know on some level? Is it just because, like, of future forking, or? Uh, we need to know if we want the parent and child to do different things. Right, if we want the parent just to continue listening for connections, and we want the child to be reading and writing with a client. In order for those two to, to be different, they need some way of knowing, am I the child or am I the parent? Yeah. So I guess, like, sort of going on that, though, the it's just like a split of, of the file almost like does the original parent matter or does it just matter that we distinguish one as the parent and one as the child that we want to do separate things? Um, like is there some point where they come back together and we need to know which version is the original parent or uh, I mean the the way that this is managed by the operating system there are it keeps track of which of the parent and there are reasons that it needs to do this but and for our purposes, we just want the ability to have them to do different things, and we don't actually care. Like, we could have the original be doing this reading and writing, and the child listening for connections. I think that that would also work. Honest. When you say in the child and in the parent, does that mean it is called in the child fork or in a parent fork, or is it returning the values to both after it's used? Yes. So. At this point, the parent calls for it. That creates this copy. And now both copies are off running at the point where fork returns in each one. So like the first thing that happens in the child is fork returns. The first thing that happens in the parent is fork returns. And it's at that point that a different value is returned in each one, in each of these two separate projects. So then, if we were to like say if we wanted 
the parent to read, and we want the child to write, right? Like, so client one is going to read, client two is going to write. Um, then we would just check, we would just check for the integer, mm -hmm. and then like, hey, if integer is equal to like the ID of client two, read. And then, hey, if integer is equal to zero, write. Um, yeah, you, you typically don't know ahead of time what this ID will be, so you're basically saying, is it zero or not? And that's how you tell the difference. Right. So, uh, can we fork out of forks, or is it always from the same process? Uh, any process can call fork. So you could have a process. So you could kind of make this sort of arbitrarily. I guess that my question would be, like, how does the return value work exactly? Because, like, like for example, if, like, say, like, child two could have like another child, so then child two would be a child and a parent. Uh, yeah, so here this this refers to the child that was just created, and the parent is whichever process called fork. Okay. So if child two calls fork, it's the parent of whatever new process came out of that. Okay. And my other question was, like, I guess I'm just a little bit confused, like, exactly how the, like, the computer knows when to call fork, because I don't think it would be very efficient to be like, if I'm going to start a process, I'm going to immediately fork it in case somebody else wants to do well, it. Well, the computer isn't in charge, the programmer is in charge. They okay. put the call to fork in their code when they want to. Alright, uh, Yemi? Oh, so the, the child process and the main process, they're not in sync though, right? Once it's spawned, it could like deviate from the original, right? That's true, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want to show you what this uh, would look like. So, um, let me do this. to the echo server um, that we've been using as this example. Uh, when we get a connection from the client, what we did last time was just call the echo function. Um, but that sends this process into the echo function and it can't do anything until, uh, it like doesn't, can't accept another connection until the echo function returns. So what we can do instead is at the point where we want to have a child process handle the echo and this current process continue on, is we can call fork. And that's going to cause this split. And the way, the kind of conventional way this is done is we say if the return value of fork is zero, then inside that if statement is what we want the child to do, and skipping over this if statement is what we want the parent to do. So in this case, we want the child to call echo, and we want the parent to kind of continue on its way. Um, if this is all that I do, will anyone see an issue with just leaving it like this? But uh, once you finish the if statement, the child goes on to the parent. Yeah, exactly. We kind of want the child to do the echo and then nothing else. And so we, after it's done with echo, we just have the child process exit and shut down. So now we forgot out the child process, it does the echoing with this particular client, and then once it's done that, it exits. Meanwhile, the original server is still just listening for connections. Oh. And why don't we close this connection? Yeah, so there are a few uh, details. For example, it would be good if we closed that connection after we were done with it. 
and we see that the parent will, after it forks, will just immediately close this connection because it doesn't need it anymore. The child's the only one that needs it. There's one other socket here that the child will get from its parent that it doesn't need at all. And so it would also be good practice for the child to close the socket that the server is listening on. Because the child doesn't need to listen for new connections, only the parent process needs to do that. Kevin? But then if the child doesn't listen for connection, how are you going to do it? Oh, wait. So, okay. So uh, let's say there are more than two clients, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you have client two, this client three, four, five, whatever. Yep. This client three, four, five children of uh, client two, or are they all children of? Uh, they're all children of the original server process. The server process just forks off a new child for each request that comes in. Other questions on this? Peter. In what scenario would the fork return one? Uh, fork returns one in the parent, well, it returns something greater than zero. Some like in, this, in this case, like in what scenario would like, we not go into the history? Uh, if we are the parent process. So fork returns a different value in the parent process than it does in the child process. Mm -hmm. So when we return from fork in the parent process, it returns some non-zero process ID. So in that well, case, it's close connection and just don't do echo. That's right, yeah. Echoes only the child process will run the code inside this if statement, which includes exiting, so it won't go past here. Uh, and the parent process, fork's going to return something that's not zero, so it won't go into the if statement. It will close its copy of the connection and then go back to the top of the while loop. Well. So in this code, are we forking only one time? Like, we're only uh, we are forking every time a new client connects to the server. As every, we're in this infinite while loop, just waiting for connection. So connection comes in, we fork, the child process calls echo, but now the parent process is back waiting for another connection. Another connection comes in, it forks off a second child to handle that client. Um, so fork will be called once for every client that connects. All right, so there are some uh, pros and cons that are worth thinking about for this uh, process, uh, uh, multiprocessing model. Uh, but before we talk about those, I want to talk about the uh, first uh, federal social welfare program uh, uh, in the United States. That was the uh, social security program created uh, in 1935. So you may recall from last time, there was a Dust Bowl, there was a Great Depression, times in the US were pretty bad, which was true basically everywhere in the world in the 19, uh, early 1930s. Uh, and people were not fond of Herbert Hoover and they kicked him out of office after one term. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was elected president. Um, and uh, here's a picture of uh, him signing the Social Security Act in 1935. Uh, and Roosevelt's kind of philosophy about uh, what the federal government should do during the Depression, Depression is just keep trying stuff. And when things didn't work, just try something else. Uh, and so this was called, uh, this, um, he called this a new deal for the American people. And there are like just a huge proliferation of these New Deal programs with all sorts of acronyms like the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, hired people to uh, build trails and uh, expand national parks, all sorts of things like that. There was uh, uh, public, the Public Works Administration, PWA, that built dams and other major public projects. 
there was the uh, National Recovery Administration, which had its own set of projects, and there was just all this kind of alphabet soup of different organizations. Um, and this was kind of transformative in the relationship between Americans and their government. Right? The government got far more involved um, uh, in the economy and other parts of uh, US society. But uh, also, this idea of a new deal brings me to my favorite uh, Roosevelt meme. So we'll, we'll end with that. Um, all right. So let's talk about uh, why this process model is good and why it's maybe not so good. So and things that are, are good. First is the obvious. Our servers can now handle concurrent connections where they couldn't before. That's great. Another nice thing is that it's just very, the, the model of like what is shared between the parent process and the child process is pretty straightforward. Um, Uh, file descriptors are not shared because each the child and the parent each get a copy. File table entries uh, are shared. Uh, so uh, that means kind of the, the parts of the uh, operating system kernel's memory that are keeping track of open files. Uh, we don't actually duplicate those, just the file descriptors. So the descriptors and the child and parents still kind of refer to the same open file. Global variables, or indeed variables of, of any kind, these are not shared because, again, each gets a copy. So the child changes some global variable. That happens in the child's memory, not the parent's. Honest. So is the memory all copied between them? Okay. Yeah, so the operating system may and will do some like nice optimizations to avoid copying when it doesn't need to, but sort of logically, each has a totally separate copy. So this last point that we kind of don't share memory whatsoever is one of the downsides. And that it can be quite difficult to share data between processes if we need to do that. Because each process has its own private virtual address space. And uh, it can be difficult to kind of arrange memory such that they can use the same memory. Or you need to maybe use files to send data back and forth. But anyway, it's not straightforward. And The other concern would be that there's like, it's not huge, but there is noticeable overhead to creating new processes. Uh, we mentioned like all the, it, it gets its own copy of the memory, so potentially there could be a lot of copying memory. 
Um, and there's just a lot of stuff that needs to happen to create and set up a new process. So there's some, some extra uh, costs that we're paying for that. So that brings us to the question of, is there an alternative to multiprocessing that might address our downsides here? This isn't the only alternative, but it's the one that uh, we'll cover in this class, uh, multi-threading. So we previously defined a process as sort of a kind of self-contained program. It has its own memory and, and so on. But another way to look at a process is it has its address space, its private memory, and then it has this squiggle, which represents a thread of execution, meaning a just like sequence of instructions and kind of the current register values, including the instruction pointer. So the kind of the part of the process that is the actual kind of instructions that it's running and the information you need to know to kind of what instruction happens next. And then there's also that process is virtual address space. And in this multiprocessing, we're just stamping out entire new copies of this process whenever we want. Uh, uh, to multiple things to be able to happen at once. Uh, but with multi-threading, we say, let's not stamp out copies of the entire process. Let's just create more of these threads within the same process. So we still have a single address space, but now we might have multiple threads, each of which can be executing different code, but all of which can interact with the same memory, the same virtual address space. Uh, and so, at least in this very simplified picture, this sort of gets at these two problems. With processes, it was hard to share data, but threads all use the exact same memory, exact same set of virtual addresses, so they share all their memory. We had significant overhead for creating new processes, uh, but now we still have to kind of create a new thing, but it's not as sort of heavyweight, not as substantial as an entire new process, address space, maybe copying memory. We just start up another thread. Questions so far? Okay. Um, do you have any examples of the string? It kind of seems like that would be uh, like multi thread. Like when there was like with the there's like two different lines of execution. Uh, there definitely were two threads, but they were not in the same process. They were kind of we created a new child process which indeed has its own thread, but they can't really share data easily and we have like a bunch of more stuff we work we had to do than just kind of creating another thread. Uh, so adding any connection is the same as adding a new thread in that sense. Or am I? Sorry, say that again. So like uh, connecting like another person connecting would be like adding a new thread. Yeah, so the, the alternative that we're thinking of instead of working out the new process, at this point instead of fork, creating a thread to handle that exactly. content. Can you go over how a fork is different from a thread? Like when creating new threads or just creating a new fork? Um, well, so creating a new process uh, involves both creating a new thread 
and creating a new address space and potentially copying over memory to that address space and updating all the operating system data structures that keep track of running processes. Um, whereas if we just create a new thread, we avoid all of that work except because we had to create a new thread as part of creating the process. So um, it might be helpful. I think it would be helpful to know like what, uh, like what does this thread consist of? Like what does a, a thread require? And so uh, a thread is going to have a stack because for a thread execution to be able to call functions and returns from them, we know that uses a stack, so each thread needs its own stack. And the thread also needs what is called the thread context, which consists of things that we've talked about a process having, because indeed each process has a thread, at least one thread. Um, But this context is going to have the register values, because you need those to have kind of a separate thread of execution. Um, and these registers, importantly, going to be stack pointer uh, and instruction pointer, just to emphasize that these registers are related to keeping track of where this thread stack is and what instruction it's on. Um, and it, the condition codes, like the, the part of the CPU that uh, facilitates like compare and jump instructions, uh, that's also going to be part of the thread context. Um, and so this is what's inside a thread. What parts of, like, what things are part of a process that aren't in this picture? Yeah. Keys. Yes. Yeah, so if we if this is what a thread is, and then we're talking about well, what is in the process that is shared between all the threads of that process. The heap is certainly an important one. Other things, Rebecca? The descriptor table. That's right, yes, all the file descriptors. Charlie? Code. Code, an important region of memory, fine. Virtual memory, right? Yeah, all of virtual memory except the stack. He, um, and this is, um, each thread will have its own stack, and each thread stack will be just placed into a different spot in virtual memory. Because you're absolutely right that the virtual address space is shared. So two threads in the same process couldn't have their stack at the same spot in virtual memory. So they're going to be kind of put in different in different places. So under this multi-threading model, we have I think it was kind of a much lighter weight way to have multiple things happening at once and happening in a way that, for example, they all share data on the heap. So this wasn't true of our echo server, but if we were in a situation where we wanted um, to have some large task and break it up into smaller pieces and have kind of a different, uh, uh, and kind of spread that work out somehow, that would be difficult to do with processes because they couldn't share the data related to that task. The, a common one is we want to sum up a really huge array and we want to split that work up. 
Well, with threads, they can all refer to the same array in a shared heap, whereas separate processes, they don't share any memory. So it would be a little more complicated for them to kind of each do part of that summing up an array. Paul. Wait, so what would be the advantage of using that process? So this is sort of a, a, a with great power comes great responsibility situation where once all our threads are sharing memory, they now have the ability to really mess with each other because they're all sharing memory. Um, and so there are situations where logically we really want to like have just two sort of isolated processes, each doing their own thing, rather than two threads that can interfere with each other's memory. So that be, so there's kind of a place for, for multiprocessing. Um, Another aspect of multiprocessing is the operating system is managing uh, processes, whereas when we're talking about threads, the picture of who is managing the threads, operating system or user code, gets more complicated. There's kind of more messiness there than I'll get into get into now. But yeah, threading basically can get a lot more complicated. All right, so I think what I'll do is just quickly show you uh, what the multi-threaded version of our echo server looks like. So um, when uh, Uh, when we get a connection, instead of forking, what we will do is call pthread create. pthread is uh, one of the standard implementations of threads for C and on Linux. Um, and there are a few things that we'll need to uh, pass to this. One of them is there's a, a pthread t, which is just going to be uh, an integer identifying uh, a thread. So we have to pass pthread create a pointer to uh, this so it can kind of update it with the appropriate thread ID. Uh, pthread takes, uh, you, there's the ability to specify what are called attributes to control how the thread behaves. Uh, I'm just, I want just the default behavior, so I pass in null for that. Um, I then need to give pthread the function that I want it, that I want the thread to execute. So unlike the process where fork makes the parent and the child start executing at the exact same point. When we create a thread, we just tell it, go run this function. Uh, so here I'd say, go run the echo function. Uh, and then uh, I need to provide the argument that pthread should pass to the echo function uh, when the thread starts. Uh, and the um, syntax here is that pthread, you have to give it a function that returns a void star and takes a void star uh, in order to be as generic as possible. Um, and so we will uh, pass, uh, we will create a pointer. Size of int. So we'll a pointer. We'll set it equal to the file descriptor, and then pass that 
pointer uh, to um, uh, the echo function. And then here we can say con fd equals star con fdp, and then free this pointer. So to create a thread, I, oh, I have used pthread create, uh, and then I need to kind of set it up to pass a, a pointer to the argument um, that echo should take. Um, uh, this would not work unless I cast it to an int star, tell it what kind of thing it points to. Um, it would also be possible to do this without malloc and free if you just passed, if you instead passed con fd directly, casting it to a void star and then casting it back when you get to echo. Um, the thing you don't want to do is to pass the, the thing that would be dangerous would be passing a pointer to the variable in the main function. Why would this be dangerous? DJ? We might be modifying the value of the... Yeah, if we pass a pointer to this variable to the new thread, but then the original thread changes the value of that before the new thread starts. Now we've lost what we were trying to pass to the new thread. So we want to make a copy somehow either through allocating space on the heap or just passing, um, passing the, the file descriptor itself. All right, that's all that we have time for today. So I'll stick around if there are questions, but I have office hours at 3.30. If you're not aware, there's a weird schedule on Friday for convocation, so this class, 5A, will be at 12.30.